Hi everybody, this is the sixth, sixth uh, webinar and we'll be talking about online democracies. My name is João Moreno Falcão and I'll be the facilitator for this event. So here we have Christian and Deborah that will be lecturing for us and after we'll discuss and ask questions and everything. So if you could write down the questions and ask later, it would be wonderful. So let me first introduce Deborah that she is, speaks first. So Deborah holds a master in, in gender development and globalization from London School of Economics and Political Science in the UK. Being awarded with a achieving scholarship, she holds a bachelor with international relations for Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. In 2015, she completed the course Gender Equality at the University of Oslo in Norway. She worked at the areas from, of activism, youth and public policy at MC International and at the University of Youth. Devon has project and communications manager at the Center for International Relations at Getulio Vargas Foundation. Her research focuses in the fields of democracy and technology, civic technologies and gender studies. She's a program coordinator of democracy and technology area in, at the Institute for Technology and Society. Deborah, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, João, for the introduction. Uh, it's really wonderful to be with all of you here on a Saturday, and I'm sure um, it's really wonderful to talk to all of you about this very pressing issue that um, has been all over the news, all over our lives, and something that we'll be talking more and more um, every day. Um, thank you, the Youth Observatory, for the invitation as well. Um, I am, you know, going to be speaking in English, but we were discussing before that it would be great if we could speak in Spanish as a common language, but maybe in a few years' time we'll get there. Um, and it's a pleasure to be um, here with all of you. I'm going to share a presentation with you, but I would really uh, welcome you to ask questions and uh, participate with examples from your own uh, regions, from your own countries, um, as I believe this is also the idea of this webinar, that we can exchange a lot on um, online democracies specifically. Also, I hope you are all safe and well in your homes, staying um, safe in this uh, very, very challenging time of this uh, sanitary crisis that we've been going through. Um, so I hope you're all safe and well as well as your families and, and friends. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen now so that you can see the presentation. Yes, Pedro, I can, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to understand. I, I completely understand that English is sort of like a common ground to all of us. Um, but hopefully Spanish will be maybe a common ground in, I don't know, a few years time or maybe even, um, Portuguese could be a common ground for all of us as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, you know, language barriers is, uh, is one of the, the issues, I think, uh, for us Latinos to kind of like even bond together even more and try to think in a more networked way uh, for the solutions that we create, especially because we have, you know, such uh, similar contexts in our countries. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, at least the, the language barrier is something that we overcome um, in a few years' time, not many years' time. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, I can, yes, I can share my screen now, great. Um, um, can, you, can you see my screen now, everyone? Yeah. Yep, yeah? great. Thank you. Thinking about uh, this topic of, you know, online democracies after the pandemic, at least this is the name of our webinar, 
Um, I think the, the first thing that calls my attention is the fact that we are talking about online democracies. And there are so many different concepts to talk about the idea of using technology and democracy or technology to foster democracy. Um, so this is definitely something that we are going to touch upon. I'm not going to be very extensive on that. The idea is not to go over like a literature review on uh, digital democracies or online democracies or whatsoever, but um, just to uh, start to start a conversation about the conceptualization of this. Um, so for, for my talk, I'm going to try to cover um, some uh, of these points, some of these topics, four of them. So we are going to start talking about a conceptualization or an idea of what online democracy or digital democracy can be. Then we'll follow on with um, what are or could be one, some of the main challenges um, to establish fully uh, participatory uh, democracies and online democracies in Latin America. And I think these challenges that we are covering here are not only regarding Latin America, they are more general, more broad, but definitely um, also they, they touch our context in a very specific way. Uh, then we'll move on to some opportunities uh, and cases in which we, uh, the idea is to talk uh, about what technology can bring um, and try to exemplify with some cases. I'm going to bring only Brazilian cases just because the idea is that you can share um, cases from your own countries. Um, so that's why you'll only see Brazilian cases in this presentation. And we, I'm going to finish with lots of questions actually for you because the idea is that we initiate this debate um, and I'm going to try to uh, outline a few of the main challenges when we're talking about what What's next? What comes after the pandemics? What are we seeing um, during the pandemic uh, that can, you know, maybe try to put us through uh, this this um, next moment or this after the pandemic? So, starting with what is digital democracy, right? Um, I think uh, I, I sometimes like to start with quotes and quotes from, you know, great authors that come before us, especially because, you know, we are the young people and I think we can and should be learning from the masters in that sense. Um, and here's a quote from a, a very recent book from Castells. Castells is a sociologist that probably many of you know, um, writing a lot about technology as well. And um, in, in, his, in one of his, la I think it's his last book, it's called Ruptura. Um, and in, his, in, in this essay, he, he really tries to talk about the evolution of democracies and how we are living through this, uh, this moment in which democracies are very fragmented, they are ve very polarized, and this is a trend that we see all over the world. Again, it's not something uh, very uh, particular to um, the Latin American context or even to the European context where he's based, but it's something that we are seeing worldwide. And I think what is really interesting in this quote is that Castells talks about this evolution of democracies, but there is something that is um, that even though um, you know these structures as political structures they evolve, they are always based on power relations, and power relations they are um, something that kind of crystallized into institutions um, in to some extent that sometimes is even impossible to break these uh, crystallized power structures to create new things to talk about new possibility new possibilities of uh, transformation so we're going to go back to power a few times especially in this first part talking about conceptualization um, one thing that um, now talking specifically about the uh, Latin American context, um, these uh, this slide and the next one, uh, I'm going to show you two um, 
graphs from the Latino Barometer. Um, and it's the latest research from 2018. Probably the, the one from 2019 will be launched soon. And here um, it's uh, the graph that talks about the support to the idea of democracy, right? Um, so it's in Spanish so that it's easy for almost everyone to read. Um, so what we see are different trends. Um, the blue one, which is the highest, talks about the, the, the uh, most answered um, to this question, which is that democracy is the preferred model, the preferred political model um, for all of these, um, you know, from, for the, these percentages here. And we see, you know, a slight decline in the, in the past kind of like 10 years. So we see from 2010 until 2018 where they have um, the, the data that it, came, it, it went from 61% to 48%. So we see, you know, a significant kind of decrease in how much, um, you know, the Latin American population prefers democratic um, institutions and democratic uh, uh, organizations for, of their countries. And another kind of like interesting number here as well is to look at the indifferent trend. Uh, the indifferent is the green one with the orange triangles. And also we see that from 2010 until 2018, there is an increase from 16% to 28%. And these numbers are quite, you know, shocking because these, and maybe specifically uh, this, um, this segment of people that are indifferent to the model are maybe, you know, what we saw um, in these shifts from the past elections in many countries in Latin America going towards a more authoritarian um, kind of uh, side of these uh, of the spectrum and um, going forward to another um, important kind of um, element when we again talk about the Latin American context is the level of trust in institutions and here we have the data from 2018 uh, from this research and um, you can again hear what the question is and um, Let's take a look at what the answers were. Um, so you see that the church is the most trusted institution um, that we have in Latin America. Um, talking about, you know, political systems in general, we know that this is a problem, right? Um, and if you see, um, you know, going down the line, um, political parties are the, from, you know, the institutions that were asked, the institutions that have less credibility than all of them. You have only 13% saying that they trust a lot or they trust somewhat political parties. And this is um, a, bit, a bit shocking, I would say, um, if we, you know, again, consider that the most um, trusted institution is the church. And on the other side of this spectrum here, we have political parties. Um, and whatever it is in between, we see here government or even the Congress or the judiciary. Um, all as we go up, we see that you know the institutions that are also on this kind of like higher tier of of trust are you know the armies and the police. Um, this says something about the state that our democracies are in, and this says something also about when we try to conceptualize what this online democracy or what this, you know, digital democracy could be, how, how is it going to be um, established in the Latin American context? So going over a few elements of this concept, um, what are we talking about when we're talking about digital democracy, e-democracy, e-government, etc.? Again, I'm not going to go into you know the small details of each of these uh, conceptualizations or classifications, but it has to do a lot with the uh, use of ICTs, right, with um, information and communication technologies for democratic purposes. 
uh, be it for the augmentation of transparency or the increase in participation or, you know, for, um, you know, the bettering of political processes as a whole. So even considering, you know, the three distinct powers, if we take a look at the legislative or we take a look at the judiciary or the executive, here we're talking about the use of ICTs exactly to promote, you know, better political processes. Um, and um, another concept that I think it's, it's quite interesting um, to see here when, again, talking about digital democracy, and I'm going to use digital democracy from here onwards, even though there are other terms that we could be um, maybe kind of um, mingling here as well, um, is this mismatch between what some uh, theorists, some political scientists called slow and fast democracy. This slow democracy would be kind of like the institutional democracy in which, um, you know, institutions are founded and um, these institutions exist in our democracies for somewhat um, around 200 years. Um, and these institutions, they have, um, you know, they have history and they have, um, you know, a, a lot of background. But... Um, here they are conceptualized as slow democracy in the sense that it's really complicated to change what these institutions are and what they represent and how they were formed. On the other side, when we talk about fast democracy, here we are literally talking about uh, the use of technology and innovation um, to twist or to transform democracy. So, um, applications, mobile applications, online platforms, chatbots, you name it. All of this is part of this idea of a fast democracy. And even though, um, you know, this digital democracy can, and there are many benefits of using ICTs and other technologies as well to enhance democracy, it's important to consider that this slow democracy, this more institutional democracy, um, doesn't change um, in the same pace that this fast democracy does. So there's kind of like a mismatch in between um, the pattern that the slow democracy transforms and the fast democracy transforms. And a final point here is regarding other technologies. So talking about e-democracy or digital democracy, there's a lot said about ICTs, but it's important that we consider other technologies as well, such as um, big data, such as the use of you know, data-driven technologies or even uh, artificial intelligence as well. These are kind of like technologies that are more on, on the bridge or on the edge of uh, the development of technologies as a whole. And these technologies are as well being used um, within this conceptualization as well. So just to take into consideration that. Um, Again, another point to try to build a common conceptualization and a common ground on what we are talking about when we talk about digital democracies is the idea of government as a service versus government as a platform. Um, and here, when we this this first kind of paradigm, uh, the government as a service, talks about a more centralized idea of government in which um, government, and here I'm talking about this very symbolic thing, uh, demands, um, uh, sorry, provide some sort of service to some sort of demand by the citizen. So the citizen needs something and the government is to provide that, is to develop whatever it is, if it's a service, a technology, um, a product, right? And um, there is, you know, I, I, I really like this metaphor of the vending machine government. So if you've used the vending machine before, you know that you have to put your money on it, select the number of the product that you need, and you get it. It's a very unidirectional you know, approach to, you know, what that service is. 
And here, when we're talking about government, we should move from this paradigm towards a paradigm of government as a platform. And in this paradigm, um, not only the, the government is responsible for developing uh, solutions and services, but um, multiple uh, stakeholders can do it. Um, so we see that um, civil society organizations can be uh, actors in that sense. Uh, even the private sector can be an important uh, actor as well. Um, academia, the media. So all of these actors, they can um, cooperate and they collaborate in building much better solutions as well because they are, you know, um, formed through multi-stakeholder associations and the development of technologies in that sense is also much more interesting. So here we shift from the vending machine government to the government 2.0, which is associated with the idea of the web 2.0, in which there is a much more uh, collaborative web in which we uh, can cooperate and collaborate. Here, the government 2.0 is just um, a, a translation of the concept of the web 2.0 into government. Another point that I think it's really interesting when we're talking about digital democracy is the idea of open government principles. So here, again, you also have them in Spanish, which is easier, but you have them as a basis um, from for many um, many governments nowadays using these principles as a basis to construct technology. And as you can see here, technology is not um, um, inserted as one of the basis of these three principles. Um, that's why I prefer to use this classification. And I know it's a little bit harder to read. So I'm just going to use this one first and then I'll go to the, to the other one. But there are three principles that should be considered. The first one is transparency, the second, participation, and the third, accountability. Um, prestação de contas for, for the Portuguese, Brazilian folks out there. Um, and as you see in this model, you have kind of like an onion model in which um, from the center, you have less participation towards you know the outer um, layers of this model in which participation is even bigger so take participation as one of the principles here you have four different levels so the first one is just the ability to inform the citizen the second one is the ability to consult with the citizen so that he or she or they are able to in input um, their information, their experience in whatever process that is being created by the government. The third is the idea of collaborating with different sectors. And finally, the fourth one is the idea of empowering. So literally sharing the power over decisions with the citizen. In this case, for, for example, um, we can think about um, Participatory budgeting, for example, can be a good way to uh, exemplify what does it mean to empower the citizen. He is the one, she is the one, they are the ones responsible for uh, deciding upon how to uh, invest some, some sort of budget, some sort of public budget. This model is that same one, but with one fourth principle um, um, added. And I'm sorry, but this one is in Portuguese. I couldn't find it in Spanish nor in English. Um, and it's the principle of technology. You can see, well, no, I'm going to be um, mirrored for you. So you can see here there's technology. And also technology has um, three layers here. So we have electronic government or here eGov specifically. Then we have open coding. And then you have open innovation. I'm not going to go again um, very specifically inside each of these principles, but they help us see um, towards where um, governments can go with digital democracies. I think they are a very good and interesting framework um, to, to use us as um, um, civil society members, but also to think about how governments can implement digital democracies as well. 
Now, moving forward to the second uh, part of my, my talk, what are maybe the main challenges or some of the challenges that we can identify when talking about online democracies? And the first of them is as access to technology. Um, and I think it's important that we kind of distinguish this access into three different levels. The first one is literally owning um, a, a dispositive or owning a mobile or owning a laptop or a smart TV or whatever. Um, whichever hardware you can use to access the internet. And this is already a challenge because even though many countries in Latin America um, have even more cell phones than the amount of, um, of population that there are in those countries. Brazil is one of those in which we have around, I think it's 20% um, more of mobile phones than the users of internet. Um, this is sort of like the first barrier when talking about access to technology. The second one is literally what is the type and the quality of internet access. Are we talking about um, internet access on our homes? Are we talking about internet access uh, only through Wi-Fi? Are we talking about internet access um, from only our mobiles or landlines, etc.? Um, and finally, the third kind of barrier on this axis is regarding digital skills. So even though you might own a mobile phone, you have access to the internet, and okay, so do you know how to use the internet? Do you know how to make the best use of that? And here we talk about digital skills. So just to give you um, some numbers, um, again, I tried to look for specific things on Latin America, and here we also have a problem um, which is good for us. Many of us are researchers, so you know, let's uh, push forward uh, for more research regarding um, quantitative data on, uh, on Latin America. But here you have the percentage of the population not using the internet. And these are uh, the estimates uh, from the ITU, the, recent, the most recent ones. You can see here that in Latin America, you, um, we, have, um, we are not um, the, the worst case scenario, as we can see that Africa is, or even the southeast of Asia. But we also have many countries with very, very low access to the internet. And here, um, also, some numbers, again, as you can see, there are many countries that don't have this data available, even the United States, uh, which is a bit weird. Um, but here we have the percentage of people with basic skills, which are considered um, literally the skills to uh, use maybe WhatsApp or send an email or go on Google and find something. Very, very basic skills. Um, you, we don't have much data from many countries uh, in Latin America, but here in Brazil, for example, only 20 to 25 to 50 percent have uh, these basic skills. Um, and you don't see um, the other countries that there is data available with, you know, very high uh, scores, for example, with the, um, the, the darkest blue the, to seven, from 75 to 100 percent. Um, so moving forward to the second challenge mapped here is this information. And I know you talked a lot about this information in the last webinar, and so I'm not going to go very deeply into that. But it's important for us to remind ourselves how does it threaten democracy and hear how um, online democracies are the basis for this threat as well. Um, so we talk about the manipulation of public discourse, the decrease of trust in public institutions, depolarization. These are just some of the very negative consequences that this information has in democracies. Um, when we look at specifically the Latin American context, there are even um, other, threat and other threats that we can identify. Um, if we're talking, for example, about more authoritarian uh, contexts, such as Venezuela, and here in Brazil, that we don't have an authoritarian um, context, um, an institutionalized authoritarian context, but more and more we're seeing that 
our political landscape, our political uh, positions are shifting towards a more authoritarian uh, context and ideology. And this is very problematic because how can we deal, for example, with the safety of uh, human rights defenders? How can we deal with um, uh, the maintenance of health of a healthy uh, public sphere considering disinformation? So I'm not going to go very uh, much further into this, but again, some data to help you uh, you'll also build uh, your own arguments. Okay, so going back to, um, to the main sources of information in Brazil, this is a research um, from Data Senado uh, from 2019. And as you see here, WhatsApp is, uh, you know, one of the most used sources of information for Brazilian people. 79% um, say they always use WhatsApp as a source of information. And we know that this is very problematic because this is one of the main channels used for uh, the dissemination of this information. Um, and we don't even have access to the data. Again, as, in, as uh, researchers, there is, it's very, very hard to investigate what's happening within WhatsApp introduction around one of the researches that uh, we did together. Um, but as you know, he probably mentioned, it's really hard to investigate. But it's really important for us to know that, um, you know, social media is being used um, for people to, you know, to make decisions. So if we have issues like this information, have more data to investigate further. Going forward to um, maybe the third uh, main kind of challenge, and I tried to look for uh, challenges talking about the context or the system, talking about um, the citizens, and talking also about um, the politicians. So our politicians, and here I'm, I'm talking about uh, the very wide range of politicians, are they ready for the use of technology? to enhance democracy. Um, so some of the barriers could be the lack of capacity. Um, many uh, public servants are not necessarily familiarized with uh, technologies and specifically good uses of technology uh, for democracies if they don't have that capacity, if they don't have those skills. Also, systemic barriers, meaning that for many years, who is in charge of kind of spreads into a systemic transformation. And third, um, maybe this could be a, a question, you know, that comes from politicians. What is it in about this for me? How is it going to make um, me be voted in the next elections? Or how is it going to um, change my position in the Congress, etc.? Um, so moving forward to um, some opportunities and cases, this is the third uh, session um, of this presentation, the third section, sorry. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples, and I might be very, very biased uh, with two of them specifically because they're projects that we developed from the Institute for Technology and Society, where I am the coordinator of our uh, democracy and technology program. Um, so please, I'm sorry for, for uh, the bias here, apologies for that, but I think they are very good examples about good uses of uh, technology to promote, to enhance democracy. The first of them, it's called Mudamos, um, and it's a mobile app uh, to collect electronic signatures on citizens' initiative draft bills. Um, in Brazil, um, in our constitution, we have a few uh, types of direct democracy mechanisms, and one of them is the possibility that any citizen can promote a draft bill for their legislative house, be it at the municipal level, state level, or even the federal level, considering that they gather a minimum amount of signatures. And so far, this process has been done paper-based. So you can imagine how many tons of papers you need in a country like Brazil, where you need, for example, 1.5 million signatures to propose a bill to the Congress. What we did was literally to 
transform this process into something electronic and digital by the creation of uh, an application, a mobile application. Um, and some of the challenges that we had to deal with were that we were thinking in this fast democracy kind of approach, and we didn't think about the slow democracy. So the first, uh, one of the first projects that reached the threshold of signatures um, could not be accepted in the legislative house because they couldn't accept the electronic format of the signatures. So we did create a good technological model, but we did not change the institution that we are going to um, act on. So we needed to, um, so after this first challenge, we needed to overcome that by also transforming the law regarding electronic signatures. So this is something that we did um, along uh, those, um, um, along, well, it's been already three to four years that we've been doing this project. And um, we've been also really concerned with this idea of crowd law, which is literally using collective intelligence to create, to design regulation to design public policy. So this is everything that Mudamos is about. And it does uh, show you a, a few opportunities that we can uh, have when we use um, technology to enhance democracies. A second example that many of you might know is Lab Hacker. Um, it is a, lab a laboratory of um, developers and also communicators and also researchers, which is inside the, um, uh, the lower chamber of our Congress in Brazil as well. And Lab Hacker works as a sandbox in which there's a lot of testing of the technologies that they are creating so that after that, they can, you know, really grow the technologies and really uh, try to implement the technologies in other legislative houses and kind of export a little bit of what they are doing. And finally, again, another example from ITS, uh, from the Institute for Technology and Society. But here, um, I wanted to bring in this example because it shows how it's important not to do things alone if it's from the civil society perspective or if it's from the government perspective. Um, this uh, project was a project that we developed in partnership with the Institute for Public Security, uh, is a public organization, a public authority based here in Rio. And the, the Institute and us, we developed a chatbot to promote um, public participation, social participation, and um, the public security councils that exist in the state of Rio, um, Rio de Janeiro. And these councils um, are open to participation for anyone that wants to, but uh, people didn't even know how to get to the councils. They, they, they didn't even know when the meetings were going to happen. So we created a chatbot to inform the population about um, when uh, the meetings were taking uh, were taking place, how they were happening, and also what the topics of discussion were going to be. After that, the chatbot also collects a lot of feedback and input from uh, the participants to kind of um, feed back into the Institute for uh, Public Security of Rio so that they can take uh, better informed decisions regarding public policy in the state. Um, and finally, I, I think I'm over five minutes of my time, so sorry for this. I'm going to finish in a minute. Um, taking a look at what's next um, regarding online democracies or digital democracies and after and during the pandemics. So maybe I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we are seeing and again using the Brazilian context as a basis but also um, the global and Latin American context where we are seeing this happening. Um, first we talk about infodemics and again I know this is something that you touched upon last week also talking about this information but how are democracies dealing with this information during the pandemics and after the pandemics? What are we doing with this? Are we um, taking measures that might be um, very 
complicated and very counterproductive regarding um, disinformation. And again, giving the example from, from Brazil, right now we have a, a legislative bill, a draft bill that's going to be voted probably uh, this week that is really complicated and really controversial uh, in terms of how it attacks the problem of disinformation by uh, diminishing um, foundational uh, digital rights such as uh, data protection, such as uh, freedom of expression, freedom of press, and access to information. How are we doing this in the middle of a pandemic without any discussion, without multi-stakeholderism, which is uh, a, a pattern for when discussing uh, regulation related to technology? A second issue here is participation. Um, are you keep are we you know keeping up with new models of participation during the pandemics um so right now we are doing pride month and here in brazil we have one of the biggest pride parades from all over the country which happens in sao paulo and last week they had a whole day of online events and online um uh, presentations but is that translating what really participation is are we taking maybe the streets into uh, the the social networks or is it maybe diminishing uh, the level of participation that we are having and issues regarding access are also um, here uh, as challenges and so since I, I did this kind of jump talking about access here um, there are many issues regarding access. One of the maybe uh, the, the biggest problems that we are seeing now during the pandemics is access to education. Um, how can we maintain public schools and public universities running when we cannot guarantee that students have access to the internet and they'll have access to um, mobile phones or even uh, computers to, go to, to continue to follow up with education and finally elections which i think it's very um it's a it's a, um, it's something very particular to the latin american context again not only but many countries uh in latin america are going to have elections this year and how are we going to um uh manage to have these elections happening in the middle of the pan pandemics um so talking for example about the 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 parties are they going to have uh, remote meetings to decide upon which candidates are going to be pushed forward as uh, official candidates? Are we going to um, create new rules uh, of safety and security when we literally have elections happening and we have huge lines of people um, you know, just waiting to vote? What transformations are we doing in that sense? Um, so these are just a few questions that um, I was starting to map out and I really want uh, you to dig in those questions because the best part is the debate. So I thank you. Here's my email and Twitter. Please follow me. Send me an email. Uh, I'll be really glad to talk to you about those issues and really eager to starting the discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, the data you brought to us is very important to understand what is happening in Latin America in the political scenario. It's very interesting to try to model the role of government in the digital democracies and the difficulties you brought to us to improve democracy at the information society are very important too. So thank you again. Now it's time for the for our next lecture. Just remember that at the end we will have an open debate, so keep your questions right. So Christian is going to present to us. He's currently program director from regional organization Asuntos del Sur and holds the Digital Integrity Fellowship of the Open Fund Tech. He is also one of the founders and members of digital rights organization interletbolivia.org and a Chiving alum. He led several projects related to civic participation, digital security, and civic technologies in Bolivia, Argentina, Nicaragua, 
Guatemala and Colombia. He has a master's in international development for the University of Bristol and a bachelor in political science from the Catholic, Catholic University of Bolivia. Christian, you have the floor. Thank you, Joao. Uh, are you going to share the screen for me, please? I must say that I, I really like your, your shirt, Joao. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, just give me a minute, please. Okay, yeah, the first uh, screen, please. So, um, thank you very much uh, to the Youth Observatory for this invitation. For me, it's quite a pleasure to be here with you and share some of my thoughts uh, with you, as well as sharing this space with uh, my colleague and someone that I admire a lot, uh, Deborah Albu. Uh, your work in the ITS is quite impressive. and We always use it as a reference. Well, the title of my presentation is uh, There is no Upward Cure for Democracy After COVID-19. And I say this both as my conclusion, conclusion as well as my introduction. Why do I say this? Um, I say this because uh, we are living probably the worst moment um, for our democracies in Latin America and probably in the world in the last three or four uh, decades. Uh, our countries ended last year in the middle of an intense political crisis. There was an electoral crisis in Bolivia. There was a demand for a constituent assembly in Chile, a national strike in Colombia against economic reforms, the judicialization of politics in Guatemala, the unveiling of anti-democratic and unconstitutional actions in Brazil, and all Trump's racist, misogynist, confrontational rhetoric and politics that are actually the epitome of everything that is wrong right now. All, all of these cases are telling us something that we are not seeing. The truth is that there are many factors that indicate that democracies need to renew themselves from their own code, their own source code, from their own GitHub repository or whatever they save democracy libraries. The accumulation of these factors are not just because of the pandemic, but something that was happening before as a recessive process of the very founding principles of the liberal uh, democracies. So what the COVID-19 did was to expose this bond that was already broken and give the reasons for the worsening of this situation. So, which are the factors that are uh, threatening the democracy system? I recognize three of them. Uh, these are uh, the information, the intermediation crisis, the same pandemic, and the inequalities and the divide. These are the same uh, data that, presented, that Deborah presented, but I'm going to present it again. Sorry for that. Uh, the first one, as I said, is what we call intermediation crisis. What is intermediation crisis? Uh, it can be summarized in one sentence. There is a chronic crisis of confidence in the institutions of democracies. Evidence suggests today that people want to have a greater say in shaping the policies that affect their lives. This was a quote of a recent report of the OECD. What is the evidence for saying this? Well, according to the same report, less than 45% of people trust in their governments. But this is not just now. This is not a problem from this moment. As, as Deborah mentioned, uh, we saw this as, as a trend in the last five years, according to the uh, Latin barometer. Uh, these surveys uh, say that actually less than 
25% uh, of people in Latin America are satisfied with their democracies. This is the red line. They were represented the, the, the blue line in the graph, but uh, that is a support to democracy. But there is also this data, this, uh, yes, data about uh, satisfaction with democracy. So 25% of people are actually satisfied with democracy. And as Deborah said, only 13% 13, 13 of people trust in political parties. This is quite a low, can you, as you can see. Why is that? Why people trust, don't, do not trust in, in parties or are not satisfied with democracies? Perhaps it's because 82% uh, of the people think that the authorities are a group of powerful people that are governing for themselves. So uh, this is huge, people. It, it practically means that uh, representative democracy is failing us. People do not longer feel that they are part of decisions or the people to whom they cast their vote actually do not, do not represent them. So when we see all these protests taking up the streets uh, last year, it's because people want to feel empowered themselves again. They are saying something and perhaps we are not hearing what they are saying. This is the same reason, perhaps, why you will notice, for example, that the Open Government Partnership and the OECD and many other international organizations are working really hard to push the Open Government Agenda as a way to increase trust in institutions. As, a, as they were presented, uh, this Open Government Agenda is one way to see how to solve this problem because uh, we really need to engage people again. They, we really need to uh, make people feel that they can decide in public policy. Okay, the, sector, the second factor is the pandemic itself. Uh, we came from a trend of an increasingly wave of authoritarian governments in Latin America, such as Bolsonaro in Brazil, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, uh, Maduro in Venezuela, and many others. But now, with the pandemic, almost all of them are authoritarian. We're talking about Lenin in Ecuador. We're talking about Bukele in El Salvador. We're talking about Añez in Bolivia. All of them are authoritarian now. Most analysts agree that this is a trend. Most governments, in order to fight against COVID-19, are approving bills that go against basic rights and give executive authorities more powers to decide quickly and without any accountability. But there is not only that, that is only a thing. What we are afraid of is that these, ext uh, these extreme powers are being used to pursue political opponents or to restrict free speech in the public space. The justification for this is to fight against fake news, to fight against infodemics. But in reality, some governments are using this to fight against uh, criticism. This, is, has, this has been quite clear in Ecuador, in Venezuela, in Brazil, and in my country, in Bolivia. What is more is that these governments are using technologies to do mass surveillance and affect many other human rights. A recent document published uh, in a couple of years, uh, days before, uh, a document by Maria Paz of Derechos Digitales, a Chilean organization that you may know. Uh, this document review at least five kinds of technologies that are being used during the pandemic and pose a threat to human rights. What are these? technologies. These technologies are uh, the interoperability of data, monitoring of infected people, traceability, autodiagnosis, and the use of a special uh, identifications, special ID, to transit in the cities. These technologies are not a, a threat for themselves. The problem is that with most of these technologies, 
uh, they are the governments are concentrating uh, personal data without any restrictions and opening this data to uh, the police and the army. So what I'm saying is that now the army might have our data and might use it for we don't know which purposes. Without adequate laws to protect privacy and personal data, these technologies are very lessic for the, our democracies. Democracy cannot function in spaces in which government owns all our data and can monitor all, everything that we do and everything that we uh, say in, in internet. The third factor uh, is indignation against a growing injustice and the lack of actions in this matter. I prefer not to talk too much about this because I'm not really an expert on these issues, but of course this is a very huge deal. This is and the, all the agenda in relation to, to injustice and equalities. We have seen in recent years the uprising of feminist groups demanding greater equality, respect for their rights and the decision over their bodies. To this agenda, we must also add the Black Lives Matter movement, which, as you know, was strengthening uh, in these recent weeks in the United States because of the murder of the citizen uh, George Floyd. Beyond the specific situations that trigger this protest, they are not recent, and we can track them as a demand that has decades going on. All these agendas related to rights and equality, uh, basically are saying that democracy is not responding to them, that uh, representation is not really the, the, the way. So be, that is why, because they are in the streets, they are demanding actual changes. So what democracy can really be, or sorry, why or how can democracy really be strengthened in an environment so hostile for rights, so hostile for inclusion, and so hostile for participation of people in equal terms. It is for these reasons and many others that we are experiencing this uh, democratic precision. So what to expect for after the pandemic? So what to expect after the pandemic? Well, there are many things that are going to be happening, but there are at least two things that are happening right now, and we don't have to wait for, for, for them in order to see how democracy is being trended. The first one is more political realism in international uh, relations. Why? As we speak, there is a campaign to save internet freedom. You can visit this campaign in saveinternetfreedom.tech. Why is this campaign happening? This week, Trump's uh, government took the US Agency for Global Media. This agency funds several organizations that are working across the world to defend human rights, protect activists, and provide technologies as signal. Signal, you know, is a, is a tool for uh, communication that is really important for activists and human rights. But this is really the top of the iceberg. Trump is also taking over other organizations such as the Inter-American Bank of Development and many others. Why is Trump doing this? Because these organizations control part of the stream for development funding. In a world where COVID-19 will require governments to do big investments in order to protect their economies, controlling development funding gives uh, Trump a great power over undeveloped countries. This is really obscure, this, this is really bad for global governance. The second thing that is happening right now is the consolidation of a po uh, uh, state police. I mean a state that controls and does surveillance to all their citizens. Take into account that as in any other critical situation like a war, during the pandemic, there has been a great investment in technologies in order to do surveillance. 
this infrastructure is already put in place and is not yet regulated. If our governments become more authoritarian, do not hesitate that these governments are going to use these technologies in order to uh, to uh, pursue uh, to pursue activists or for political purposes. Of course, this is very subjective for me to say, but we have already seen how governments act with these technologies. Our governments are really capable of using these technologies in order to uh, pursue people. Think about uh, the Pegasus software or malware in Mexico. Think about the PRISM program. Think about many other of these cases uh, going around in, in, uh, and they are used by these governments. All right, how this context will break the internet again? because the internet was already broken, but how this context will, will break the internet again. So uh, the next slide, please. This is not something for me to answer, but it's something for us to discuss. But I want to end my presentation with several critical questions that I hope we can retake uh, during the open dialogue. Some of these questions are, are we going to have less and less multi-stakeholderism in the internet governance agenda? Another question is that if this means a setback for the digital rights agenda. And a third question is that uh, these technologies that they are implementing are actually techno utopist technologies and these technologies are not really strengthening the democracy. What is clear now is that more than ever, internet as a technology, as well as a public space, is in a critical danger of becoming an instrument to control and manipulate citizens. Democracy cannot survive where there is no internet freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I think the info that you brought to us is very important because we need to try to understand how the representation crisis, the pandemic and the inequalities have impact in our democracy and how this problem could be used to attack our society, how this will influence in the information society in a whole. So after, I'll first say that we have a program open to us that is a call for applications for open internet for democracy leaders that I'll put this link to in the comments. And our next webinar is going to be about the COVID-19 privacy and cybersecurity. I um, would like to open to questions and the discussion. Thank you again, Christian, for your lecture. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask a question in relation to the challenges uh, posed by Deborah. Uh, many citizens uh, who do not have much contact with technology still feel vulnerable with the electronic services offered by the government. Uh, they do not trust the, the technology and its security. So in that sense, uh, what do you think is the best way or tool to close the gap that exists between digital natives and non-digital natives to achieve an upward curve of democracy by relating it to Christian's approach. Uh, I know it's not an easy question, but I like your, your opinion. Thanks. Um, Jean, sh should we take more questions or should I answer this one and then continue? Oh, I, I think you can answer this one. We have time. Um, so, yes, it is a very uh, compli complex question, I think, ben Benjamin. And maybe um, I'll, I'll try to give you an example of how I think um, maybe things could be dealt, you know, in order to try to answer your question. Um, but here in Brazil, during the pandemics, we had uh, a public policy regarding uh, an emergency kind of financial aid 
for people, for citizens uh, that are from lower income classes. Um, and this financial aid could be um, accessed through an application, a mobile application, or people could go to um, one of the public banks that we have in Brazil. And uh, what we had was uh, an incredible phenomenon of more than 30 false applications being created um, for, you know, to kind of like simulate that they were the official application from the government. Um, and when people would download and input their personal data in the application, of course, their data would be stolen. So your question is literally about the fact that even though people have um, you know, a, a mobile phone or whatever uh, hardware to access the internet, even if they have literally uh, a data package to, you know, use the internet freely, even though it's really expensive in Latin American countries, we know that the prices of uh, data packages are even higher than many other contexts in the, all over the world. It doesn't mean that people will have the necessary digital skills for that. Um, so my take in that sense is that um, digital skills should be built as a basis uh, in our um, educational programs. Uh, this should be basic as we study history or mathematics, we should study digital skills. And we know this already. Uh, and we know this so much that, you know, many uh, university courses are changing their uh, their 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 you know, structure of their courses to include more digital skills and learning of technology and learning of, you know, uh, related terms or related uh, topics in that sense, because this is so crucial to uh, the future of work. This is so crucial uh, to whatever it is that's coming uh, with the increase of artificial intelligence, with the increase of uh, big data and, and all of that. So um, I think it's really fundamental to have digital skills being taught at, uh, you know, basic educational level, because this is the only way that we can prevent, for example, a problem like this happening. This is the only way that we can prevent um, disinformation from being an even bigger uh, problem, because it is going to be a bigger problem, and, and it is going to be a very a much more complex problem, right? We know that, for example, now with deep fakes, it's easier to uh, go through disinformation that is more text-based to information that's going to be more image-based and it's information that's going to be even video-based. So all of these issues, um, they are you know, really complex to be solved in this, again, very uh, fast-tracked way of trying to solution them, but we need to think structurally that digital skills should be also as uh, the base, uh, should be in the base of education so that we can prevent issues from that from happening. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So, Eduardo, do you want to ask a question? Yes, I just have a little question for you both. First, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative, just like Benjamin said. Uh, about the context of the pandemic, the pandemic accelerated the use of the internet. Uh, since now the forms of expressions are relaunched through, through the internet. I have two questions. Can the internet, uh, can the internet make the political environment more representative? And about the text that we had to read, uh, the Congress of several countries uh, are closed. Do you believe that this is a problem for, the, for democracy? Thank you. Can you repeat the second question, please? I, I didn't hear it. Yeah, the Congress of a lot of countries, like in Brazil, are closed because of the pandemic. Do you think that is a harm for democracy system? Deborah, do you, do you want to answer first? or okay. So, first one, can the internet, um, can the acceleration of the use of the internet can make uh, more can make democracy more representative something like that was right um so for me not really because of the you know the digital divide uh, this is a big problem for many countries you know there are countries that 
they have less digital divide like uh, Brazil, like Chile, Costa Rica, uh, perhaps Argentina. But all the other countries, they have huge digital divides. And these digital divides become uh, bigger when you um, try to compare, for example, the use of the internet between people in the cities and people in the rural area. Or, and this can become also intersectional because if you are going, you add more uh, demo, demographic uh, characteristics, the digital become the digital divide becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. For example. Uh, a man, a, a white man in the city that has a, a high economic uh, income, you know, has, of course, has a less, uh, has a, a bigger or increasing use of internet compared to an indigenous woman uh, uh, that is poor and, and so on. So yes, this is a big problem. So if if we need to depend on internet in order to participate in politics or even for education or any other kind of services, what we are doing is to leave many people behind. This is a big problem. For example, in, in my country, in Bolivia, uh, there is a calculation in which less than 30% of uh, of students, they can uh, less than thirty percent of students can uh, continue uh, having classes during the pandemic. So this means that seventy percent of students they they do, will, won't have classes at all. So this is a big big problem. That, that is why I think yeah the, um, the digital divide make that internet becomes less representative in this moment. And the, the other question is about the Congress. Yes, this is a big problem because uh, many governments, um, they are legislating by decree uh, and not legislating with their, uh, with their support of the, of the Congress. And in, in countries like Bolivia or in countries like Ecuador, uh, yeah, this is making the executive more powerful, more Authoritarian. Can I maybe just add to um, to, to the second question um, uh, regarding the first one? I think I'm I'm totally with you, Christian. Um, even though um, there, I mean, the internet is uh, an enabler in some ways to some specific movements, as we are seeing, for example, with Black Lives Matters, as we've seen with um, the feminist movement in Brazil, um, and you know many other hashtag campaigns, for example. You know, um, in general, uh, the internet is not going to make, um, you know, politics and democracies more representative because of these issues. Um, but regarding the Congress, um, and maybe, uh, again, I'm, I'm talking about Brazil, but I think in, in that sense, we are a, a, good, uh, a good case to explore. Um, the, the Brazilian Congress has uh, implemented the digital deliberative system uh, literally three days after the pandemics were, um, were um, kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the World Health Organization said, okay, we are in a pandemic now. Um, and of course, this digital deliberative system was not created from day to night. It was created; it has been created uh, for many years already because our Congress has uh, uh, um, has been creating a tradition of using technology uh, to. Uh, um, to not only uh, for deliberative purposes, but for many other purposes as well. Um, and in that sense, that is a very good example. So um, no, our Congress is not completely closed. Um, very differently from other countries, we are not legislating only by decree in this moment. But um, for example, um, in the legislative process itself, before we actually go to the plenary sessions in which we literally, uh, the representatives are going to deliberate, we have uh, thematic commissions, we have specific commissions for the discussion of those bills, we have uh, the participation of civil society, we have the participation 
of different sectors that are going to be affected by those bills. And right now, these commissions, they simply don't exist. Um, so in that sense, we lost one of the uh, most democratic parts of the legislative process itself. Um, so yes, technology does enable uh, you know, the, the, uh, the maintenance of some part of the legislative process and some part of the work that's being done uh, by the legislative power, but definitely not all of it and a big chunk of it which is the most participative one, has been completely cut out. Um, on the other hand, many uh, legislators, many representatives has, have been thinking about how to implement this. How are we going to do, I don't know, a public audience with, what, 1,000, 2,000 people online on a Zoom chat? It's, it's just, you know, physically and technologically impossible. So we also need to think about how to create new technology that enables th those things. Um, so this is why in my presentation, I also try to, to bring some opportunities because technology can be, um, um, you know, something that strengthens democracies. In general, it's not what's happening and it's not what's happening in this context, but there are opportunities and there are possibilities for that. Um, so I think it's also important that we don't see, you know, okay, this works, this doesn't work. We also see whatever it is, the shades of gray that are in between, um, you know, these, those, uh, these extremes of the spectrum as well. Thank you very much. Again, me. <laughs> uh, I would like to share something just in regard of that. Uh, I think that uh, has its advantage and disadvantage. In Mexico, uh, for example, the, implement, uh, the implementation of CROWLA uh, hasn't paralyzed the justice, the justice system. Uh, the, the Supreme Court, Court has held uh, public virtual meetings uh, where the process can be observed. Uh, the other hand, uh, however, Congress was on the verge of approving uh, recently a constitutional reform that sought to merge certain institutions that would have the effect of taking away the autonomy of the Telecommunication Institute and would, and would greatly affect the principle of network uh, neutrality. So that's why I, I say it's advantage and, and, dis and disadvantage. So do uh, have anyone uh, a question or some collocation to do? So I think that's it for today. I really appreciate the participation of everybody. That was a very good webinar. Christian and Deborah had a very great points that they brought to us. So thank you again. Remembering that the next day of the next webinar will have about COVID-19 and cybersecurity. You can check the application for open internet for online leaders, for democracy leaders that are in the description. So thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Peace with you. Bye. Muchas gracias. Ciao. Gracias a todos. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Buenas noches.